While I was working on my session library, I thought my dirty write support was a bit unsophisticated, so I wanted to see how other frameworks handled it. To my surprise, I found that Laravel does not do any dirty write checking in their session code, nor do they do any locking. This can lead to seriously unexpected consequences, so I thought I'd demonstrate them today. What you see here is the basic Laravel uh, starting page, and I've added three AJAX requests to the bottom. We simply go to the words one, two, and three. In my routes file, I've sent them all to a session controller with the method names one, two, and three. Here are the requests. All right, here, here's the controller and the methods, and we can see that the first one simply reads the session key and spits it out. The second one reads the session key, increments it by one, stores it to the session, and then spits it out. The third one just reads the key and spits it out. It should function like this, where I'm reading uh, the session value and I get the session state represented by A, and then I write. When I'm done with the request, I write back the same state. In method two, I'm incrementing, so I read A and I write back A prime, which just represents a different state of the session. And in the third uh, request, I'm gonna read the new state, which is the key incremented by one, so it should be one. And then I write back the same state. This is how the session works. In the beginning of PHP, you read the session, and then at the end of the process, uh, without any dirty write support, you just write back what you read. And we'll see how this goes. So I have my network panel and my browser loaded. I'm gonna load the page and we're gonna see three uh, Ajax processes running. We're gonna see one just reads a value of zero because the key isn't set. The second method increments it by one, and the third process still reads a value of zero. What's going on there? It should read a value of one. Let me refresh it. Okay, we have zero, one, and zero. Now you might be thinking that I'm not saving to the session at all, but what's happening is, let's go back to our scenario. What's happening is that I've purposely made this process take longer than it needs to to demonstrate uh, a scenario. Now, we don't know why process one may take a long time. Um, it could take a long time for any number of reasons. It's doing a lot of work, or uh, maybe PHP just needs to reload its cache, and for somehow, it, for some reason, it takes a long time. And what happens then is that the session write moves all the way to the end when this process finishes, and all these AJAX, because they're running concurrently, any change that they, that they did get clobbered because there's no dirty write support. So uh, when I'm done with my session, I just write back exactly what I read. So this is why we see that no matter how many times we refresh, we're always getting the value of zero. Now, there's two ways to remedy this situation. One, as I've been saying, is dirty write flag. And what that would do is it would essentially delete all writes where the value hasn't changed. So it would delete this write, and it would delete this right. It would keep this right because we see that the value has changed from A to A prime. And when I'm done, then the value in the session should be the modified A prime and I should be able to reload uh, my page and see my key increment by one every time I reload, which is what we expect to happen. Now, the other way of handling this is with database locking, database transactions, or a locking mechanism. And Database transactions are just simply a form of locking mechanism that happen to have a rollback feature. And so the native PHP, when you use PHP's native sessions it stores to a file, it asks the operating system for a file lock. And what that means is that any other processes that are trying to hit that session concurrently, they just wait or they block until the lock is released. You can imitate that behavior in a session in a database by using uh, transactions and row level locking so what happens is that the first process 
wants to acquire a lock before it reads. Once it's acquired this lock, no other process can read from that table or acquire a same lock until this one is released. So if we lock, then we read the session table, we get this state of A. Now concurrently, process two wants to lock, but since there's already a lock obtained, it has to wait. Process three wants to get a lock, but it has to wait. So then this is from our first process one. It, when it's finished, it's gonna write back A, and then it's gonna commit the transaction, unlock the table. Now our process two can go forward. It's gonna read the state of the session. It's gonna modify it, write back A prime, then it's gonna unlock. And our third process will finally get to read the status of A prime and it's not modifying, but it's going to write back A prime. So we see that the locks help to take what is concurrent and make it happen in, in a serial way. It happens one by one. And the consequence of that is that the time it takes for each process extends. So no longer are process two and three really short, but they have to wait till one is done. This is pretty easy to implement in Laravel, so let's see what it looks like. I'm gonna go to the database handler. And so what we do right here is the query builder is gonna say get query find session. We just comment that out. And all we do is add lock for update, which is a special syntax for MySQL. I'm not exactly sure how you do it in Postgres, but it's gonna row lock <clears throat> any rows that, that this query touches. And we have to actually do this inside of a transaction. So I'm just gonna execute um, set auto commit zero so that this transaction doesn't auto commit the very, you know, every time we do a select, it's gonna commit any transaction. So we have to set auto commit zero. So this lock for update will stay. And then in the right of the database driver, this is the database driver for Laravel. In the right, all we're gonna do is commit and then set auto, auto commit one. Uh, after we write our session. And I'm not sure what this code is right here. So I commented it out because it really wasn't helping me work. Um, I think this is an attempt to fix some concurrency when you are initially starting off a blank session, but it's messing with this system of locks. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna remove it. So let's go see what this looks like. Okay, now that we have the locking in place, let's see how these three processes load, right? Now, we saw that number three came in right away because when things are concurrent, we can't actually guarantee that one is gonna happen first. Even though they're written in the source code that way, the browser may decide randomly to do a certain one first. So we see that it has a value of zero. One has also, in the session, the, the, the key is stored to the value of zero, and then two is one. And if we reload, we should see that everything waits for a second. Let me actually slow this down. Maybe you can see it better. Uh, let me sleep for two. So you can see that all the other processes wait, and you can actually see that their time is, is longer than the first one. And what we actually see is the numbers are incrementing the way we expect it. This gets a value of two. The second process gets a value of three. The third process also gets a value of three. We refresh it, we'll see three, uh, four, and four. Well, we'll see three here because that happened first, but we'll see three. And then the second process it increments, increments it to four. We refresh. We're always getting three first. That's kind of crazy. So we see that this locking mechanism works, but there's drawbacks to it. Let me show you what those are. So the problem with using transactions and locks is that all of your normal processes and all their SQL interactions are now nested under one transaction. So if you have complex SQL or other transactions that roll back, your code may not be aware that it's actually now sort of you're, you're kind of doing sub transactions when maybe you didn't mean to. So all this, all your regular SQL is now indented under this transaction because in order to gain our lock on the, on the session table, we need to start a transaction and we don't commit it until the very end. So basically all this is, all this SQL is in here. What might happen is if, if, 
if the process dies and we do a rollback, it may be different behavior than what you're expecting. Maybe you're expecting some partial SQL inserts or something like that to happen. And this is sort of strange. So there are side effects to this behavior. I'm not gonna call them drawbacks. What you could do is that you could have all your session in a separate connection. So rather than this being indented, what would happen is um, this would sort of be on a different plane. So if we have red for this, uh, we may say that, just say that this connection is using uh, yellow. And so if we actually open two network sockets to the, to the uh, server, why is that not getting any bigger? And so if we define two MySQL connection handles and uh, use them separately, the transaction, so we only talk to the session table in one connection, and then we do all of our app stuff in another connection. This would allow us to sort of uh, unindent these statements and they would be behaving normally as we expect them to and this connection would be open for the whole length of the process and it would only do two basic statements begin transaction read and then at the end commit uh, update and commit but you're using double the amount of connections if you have a finely tuned server child relationship you may not want to waste two database connections every single time just to avoid that. So let's talk about the dirty write method of, of solving this problem. So if we go back and look at the sort of the dirty write flag where we're not writing unless there's a change, this seems to work and it seems to work okay and our processes are really small and they don't step on each other's toes because we're not locking. The problem is this only works in situations where only one of your concurrent processes is changing the session data. If this were duplicated, this whole thing were duplicated as uh, a step four and it happened down here, you'd still run into the same problems where it's going to clobber what's happening in two if it's happening concurrently because you can't guarantee that the you know concurrency means they're happening at the same time so this this picture isn't exactly representational of time so if we have a four that also uh you know reads and updates then this could happen right in the middle of two and it could clobber two as well, just like uh, just like it did originally. If two takes too long, um, it would be reading A, and instead of A prime, it would be writing A prime prime or something like that, and it would be in color brown or something like that. So I know you can't read it, but the dirty right flag only works under limited conditions. Now, it does eliminate a lot of the possibility. It does, you know, it works in a lot of the situations because how many times are you actually changing the session? Not often. But without dirty writes or locking, anytime you change the session, it has the possibility of, possibility of being overwritten by something that didn't change the session because we're just sort of blindly writing everything we read all the time. So one of these two methods is going to get you a lot closer to your end goal of not having stuff deleted from your session unexpectedly. Now, the best way to do this is to have atomic sessions uh, 
atomic session action. And I'm going to show you what that would look like. So when we are uh, dealing with the database normally, if we're adding a new user, adding something to a cart, we don't sort of load the user at the beginning of the process, then wait a couple milliseconds and save it at the end, just like session. So the session stuff in PHP is a little weird. If any time we had to modify the session, we did it in one small atomic operation wherever we needed to, we could get rid of the problems with locking in that all of our processes are uh, have to wait until the other one is completely finished. But we could get some concurrency and we eliminate the problem, sort of the dirty right where, yeah, it works, but it doesn't work in all situations. So imagine we have a process and it reads the session, it gets a key of one, and it's a really long process. Process two starts and it reads the session and the session has key one. But now we have a special atomic function called session increment. And we're not gonna say, save a session that is dollar key plus plus or key equals key plus one. That's happening in the code. That's happening over here in the process and that's not good. So what we want to do is we want to get that operation as close to the database as possible so that it can be atomic. So assuming that we have our own special functions to operate on the session atomic way, we can very quickly acquire that lock on the session table, read it to get the latest value, make that change, and write it back. So both of these processes, one and two now, are are trying to read the database and increment by one. If we start with one, we should end up with three because we're incrementing once, incrementing twice, right? So now process one later, at a later point in time, it's trying to do the same thing. So it's gonna do session increment. And now again, if this is an atomic thing, it can lock the database, read, and it's gonna read two now, right? We started with one, but now it's gonna read two it's going to increment because it's not caring about what its local value is. We're trying to move this operation as close to the database as possible. So we're not going to say key equals key plus one. He's going to save to three. And so this may look a little strange to process one. Process one says, hey, I have key equal one. I'm going to increment. And now it equals three. But that reflects what's happening in the real world. If we If we take our myopic view of the inside of process one and say, what's happening in the real world where things are happening concurrently, that it should be three. And so if you're going to write a session library and you're going to sort of eject all of the standard PHP, you're not gonna to try to hook into session set save handler, you're not gonna support dollar underscore session global, and you're not, you know, if you sort of wipe that slate clean, then you're not beholden to the load at the start, right at the end paradigm. And you can do something like this. You can say, I have a special session increment, session decrement, session add array key, uh, you know, any, the more fine grain you can make the operation, uh, the more atomic you can make it. And your locks are very, very short. So what I, I guess what I didn't write here is, you know, after this, after this is set, you'd want to unlock and therefore things aren't waiting for your entire operation. They're only waiting for this one minor read, update, write. If you want to know more about how databases can break, there is a fellow named Athyr, A-P-H-Y-R, and he has a really in-depth blog about distributed databases and what can happen when one of the nodes goes down and how they try to resurrect themselves. Much, much heavier, more detailed stuff that we than what we were talking about here. Uh, it took me probably, I had to read each blog post about three times before it started to make sense, but really good stuff, highly recommend it. I hope you learned how you can safeguard your session data from accidental overwriting. It may require you to write your own database session handler by hand, but shouldn't artisans take pride in making stuff by hand?